Last week, another 11,000 South Africans became HIV positive, bringing the total to over 4 million infected with HIV countrywide. This week, it could be you. Don't chance it. Avoid HIV. Avoid AIDS. Practice safe sex. Kanaka condom or abstain. The choice is yours. Protect yourself. Unga tata ma chance. He was messing around. He was he was going with prostitutes and other women all the time. He was out there doing all these things and I was at home waiting for him and, and, and living in this little dream world. I loved women, you know, and uh, I, just, I just couldn't stop myself from messing around. I totally believed in love and I believed uh, that, you know, we were married. Um, me and he were going to be together forever and, and I was totally dedicated to him. I, I used to place Martin on a pedestal. I used to totally adore him. I was, I was like, I was like, you know, most of the time, uh, if not under the influence of alcohol, uh, then on a high, you know, and, and, and that was like, that, that was always like a stimulant, you know, and when I was, when I was like that, I, I wanted women, you know. Sex is an addiction. Sex, cocaine, casinos. The more you do it, the more you want it. I believe that HIV is spread through sex workers because it is not controlled. We have to legalise it in order to control it. We cannot have a 12-year-old standing on a corner. Let's get the children off the street. I believe in health before I believe in money. I insist on safe sex. 90% of clients are aware of the danger and also don't want to risk their lives. Having the perception at the time that it was only for gay people and uh, it only belonged to black people. Uh, the first thing that came to mind was that the doctor's making a mistake. When I, when I had to actually stand there with my daughter in my hands and experience an HIV test being done on my daughter, that was the worst part of it. And, and knowing that if it was a positive one, it was because of me. For Martin, the lesson learnt in the horror of that moment was that of the sins of the father the consequences of reckless choices made in one's life on those closest to you. Divorced by his wife Sally, to this day Martin, now employed full-time by Eskom in their AIDS division, thanks God that neither his wife nor daughter were found to be HIV positive, as he takes on the ignorance, bigotry and denial that still exists around the perception of HIV and AIDS countrywide. Same perception, even today. What about people? Yeah, no, what yeah, about yeah, women yeah, being yeah, raped? Yeah, are you going to yeah, yeah, blame yeah, women yeah, who being raped as well? Go sit at the bar, have a couple of drinks. Okay, this is obviously for people that want to know what is happening. Are you with me? Yeah. Thank you very much. In this country, every single day, 1,700 to 1,800 people are becoming infected with this virus. Uh, I'm very fortunate uh, in the sense the work that I do allows me to talk about my condition basically every single day. And that helped me very much in, 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 in coming to terms with what has happened. It wasn't easy. And people should not think that it's an easy thing that just happens overnight. I'm a person living with this virus for 10 years already. It took six years in a wilderness of drugs, alcohol and depression before Martin finally pulled his life back together, reconciled with his ex-wife Sally and committed himself to using his own life experience as a lesson to others. We have too many people saying the wrong things, hurting other people. Do you know how many people live with heart so in their lives? There's a woman that has lost a son. Have you seen really? somebody that died of AIDS already? Have because you I am not promiscuous. Have you because seen somebody that has died have you, of this virus? Uh, no, I don't want to. But why I don't do you think it's a laughable thing then? The big thing is, is that Martin's changed his life. He's, he's, he's a total different person to what he was. I'm very, I'm very proud of my wife uh, in that sense. I, I think she's a terrific woman. Uh, I many a time I ask myself, 
if, if this was reversed and she was the positive one and I the negative one, what would, what would I have done? I love him? No, I don't know. <laughs> I, I admire him now and I've got respect for him now. Yeah. But the love I had for him, um, no, that's, that's, that's gone. Um, but I think he understands that. Uh, he doesn't, uh, I can't see us having a, a, a husband-wife relationship. I'm doing it for my daughter. I was very close to my father and uh, when he died, uh, I was also 16 years old. So I would rather have to and know her father. Uh, I don't know for how long, but I wouldn't want to have taken that away from her. The time that I came out publicly, there was a, there was a big noise in the bank about it, you know. Uh, I think also that I was basically, I think, the first white person in this area, uh, you know. And a lot of white people still have this perception that it doesn't belong with us, you know. A lot of my friends, uh, I think, behind, I think they, you know, they, they've read about Martin in the newspapers or they've seen him on, on TV, but they've never really confronted me about it. But a lot of them, I think, are, are behind, are still, you know, ch-ch-ching about Martin, but... The fact is their husbands, I know, are also, uh, when they've got the opportunity, men go away, they go on uh, courses or stuff, and then they go. They go to other women as well. So there's going to be a lot of women sitting with that same problem, yeah. The definition that we use is men who work away from home and do stressful work. Now that goes well beyond a hostile dweller. That includes executives, leadership. There's no class immunity to HIV. In the early stages of an epidemic like ours, the middle class is as affected. With time, the middle class is better positioned to change behavior, learn the lessons. But in the first phase of the epidemic, there's a very high infection rate amongst the middle class who hasn't understood what it was facing. <coughs> My name is Chrissy Johnson. I'm 11 years old and I have AIDS. I was a director of a care centre for people with AIDS called the Guest House, and um, that was in 90, 1991. And of course he was admitted as a child with AIDS. That facility closed down due to lack of funds. Um, at a board meeting I just said I'd take him home, so I brought him home. I've never adopted him, I've never signed a document for him. And I've just had him for eight and a half years now. Hello, Mama Jill. He does lots of for me. He does me. He brought me into a healthy life and gave me all the support. I think she's the best mommy I could ever have. I'm not a pampering type of mother. And I also feel with a child with AIDS, you've got to treat them as normally as possible anyway. I, I try very hard not to allow him to get in this I am dying uh, frame of mind because if I allow that, he will die. The morning when I get up, I have to do my chores, feed the cats, and then I have to have my mercy and my breakfast. Oh, he's got his little list of duties that he's had ever since he moved in. The cats are anorexic by the time he's finished feeding them, but yeah, no, he's still got to do them. I'm actually on the cocktail. One is AZT and and then all my medicines. There's about three, three, three medicines I have to take. Morning one is a syrup, and the rest of all pills. I have to take them twice a day. I haven't seen any side effects. He says he hasn't had any. I think the the, the immune system is going to be building up slowly. He's on sort of supplementary things as well. We've had people phone us with herbal stuff and, and other kind of supplementary things, which he takes as well. Um, because if he wants to try something, he has every right to try it. We don't make an exception. He is a child like any other child in my school. We treat him exactly the same way. And uh, he will tell you that he even got a little smack the other day for being naughty. I think in the beginning the parents were very uptight about Nkosi actually coming into the school with the AIDS. 
because I think in, originally there was not enough education on, for people about AIDS. Even personally myself, I was scared of it because you know, I didn't know enough about it. But one thing, of course, he has done is he's taught us all a lot about AIDS. There wasn't a policy around admitting infected children or children with AIDS. And now there is a policy as a result of Nkosi. And I'm very proud of that because he actually pioneered it. But the, t the, the school itself is phenomenal. They've been superb. And I personally believe they should be used as an absolute role model in this country. Gift, the youngest of five children, orphaned when their parents died a week apart from AIDS-related diseases last year, is HIV positive, and now also lives on weekends with Gail and Nkosi, and during the week is cared for at Nkosi's Haven, a sanctuary established for HIV mothers and their children by Gail Johnson, in memory of Nkosi's late mother. When you've got a child who's HIV positive, that medication is imperative that you give it daily. And it's a lifestyle, and very few people seem to realize that. So I brought him home. And he lived with us since September last year. And he's now just been admitted to Corsi's Haven, five nights there and two nights with me, because we got him into a creche, uh, which is just across the road from Corsi's Haven. And he needs it. He's a very bright little guy. The philosophy of Corsi's Haven is to keep the mother and child together. So it's for infected mothers and their children. We've got four residential AIDS orphans now whose mothers were living there. And it's run on the kibbutz style of living. And I want to take the project nationwide, or parts of the project nationwide. Our life here is really a heaven. This is actually what they call a heaven because for me, it really it really left me up. My health is mostly up and down. I'm mostly like a yo-yo. For me and my son, okay, well, life is doomed, but I pray that one day the cure come before my child dies. But he's quite strong and he's such a beautiful boy. And uh, he's also clever at school, one thing which I'm proud of. I enjoy being with the people here. They are all my sisters, and their children are all my kids, as I call them. And I like being here than anywhere else. This is actually where I wish to die. This year has been his worst year ever. He has got sicker and sicker. The diarrhea is frequent now. He's lethargic. He has no energy. Um, at one stage, I think he would quite easily have wanted to cop out. Um, we seem to have turned that round a little bit mentally. What can I say? Um, I don't look at him every day and think, my God, my son, you're dying. Let's live this as the last. Wash on the arms or wash your back, okay? You know, if he had to say, girl, I want a, a, a scale electrics, I'd say, no, I can't afford it. I wouldn't b borrow the money because he's dying of AIDS and God let him have one for the last week of his life. I'm not like that. You all right? Okay. You're gonna have a good night? Yes. What are you fighting with? I'm fighting with my mind, my body, and my, and my body, my when he told me that he had heard a voice uh, telling him that he needed to die or was going to die, and I said to him, do you want to die yet? And he said, no, not yet. So I said, well, then we've got to fight. So when I say goodnight to him now, I ask him what he's fighting with, and he fights with the mind, the heart, the soul, the body, the tummy, as in food, his medicine, and, well, he's fighting for a new car for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> the car's for me. Yes, Mommy, yeah. The rest for you. Okay. Have a good night now. Okay. Yes, we love. love you lots. I would like to make sure okay. lots and lots and lots of people around the world 
So what I would like to do, I would like to lecture, to teach people that we're not monsters. For people living with HIV and AIDS, respect, compassion, just knowing that someone cares are small things shown that can help get them through their day. Muhammad Kaji, volunteering relaxation therapy skills, has found his way to show that he cares in the support group and empowerment classes for HIV pregnant women run by Florence in Gobeni. You know, to empower women is a very nice word that we usually use, but what does it really mean to empower a woman? Does it mean that you give her information and she goes home, she can still not introduce condoms to her husband? So why can't we start targeting more men and ask them what's their problem? It's nice to smile sometimes, ne? Yeah. to laugh, ne? Yeah. and this man makes us laugh. I found out 96 that I was positive. Whenever I do something, I want to do it now. I don't want you to tell me I can do it in 10 years time. I'm, I'm a very bubbly person, naturally as well. And I think it has helped me to smile every day. And it's normally very hard if you're not having a job and you're HIV positive and you don't have treatment, you don't have support. So I'm encouraging people to actually try and respect people who are living with HIV. Give them a chance. Working in the African urban context of Soweto, the perinatal HIV research unit at Chris Harney Baragwanath Hospital is piloting research on issues such as the management of antiretroviral drugs in a domestic environment lacking water, electricity and refrigeration, as well as the renowned program on prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV, which raises complex ethical issues. We have found out from our research and research done in Africa that giving one dose of nevirapine, a, a drug, an antiretroviral drug, an anti-HIV drug, giving one dose to the mother when she's in labor and giving one dose to the baby after birth will halve the transmission of mother to child at a cost of about 21 rand. And to date, um, we've had no major side effects or complications. Should you provide these types of drugs in a society that is unable to keep the infected women and the fathers of these newborns alive. In other words, can South Africa want to have hundred thousands, if not a million, orphans without, at this point in time at least, having the logistics, the infrastructure in place to make sure that somebody will take care of these children? If your primary objective is to create seven-year-old heads of households, and this is what you would do if you, at this point in time, would provide this sort of medication, I think it might be a wise move not to provide this sort of medication, instead counsel women to have abortions. Termination is a very important option that we discuss with women. Unfortunately, a lot of women book very late, so they only book when they're about 28 weeks pregnant and safe to do an abortion under 20 weeks of pregnancy. So it is an option for women who book early and who know the HIV status early on. Institutions like the Salvation Army's Kel Satoli Center have long represented the fragile and unsung safety net for those children abandoned, orphaned, or rescued from abusive family environments. HIV AIDS in the community now bring additional casualties as babies born HIV positive are abandoned and young children orphaned when increasingly both parents die of AIDS-related diseases. These young girls from Bethany Home are not HIV positive, but help care for HIV positive babies in the adjoining Bethesda Home project. These uh, young girls help us a great deal because after school they play sister to these uh, young children. And as a result, it is sort of the children are growing in you know, a family sort of uh, place. Through her community-based support care project, Mrs. Amnisi brings assistance for HIV-positive children identified in the community. Where doctors have prescribed medication, she helps monitor correct dosages and instructs how best to care for a sick child in the home environment. Good nutrition is also a crucial factor, enabling HIV-positive children to live a longer and healthier life. We bring food parcels which are just basic foodstuffs in it. But you know, there's a lot of poverty out there. Sometimes when we go there, we find that even the granny herself has not had anything to eat that day. And as you realize, then everybody benefits out of whatever we give. 
In other situations, the child may not be HIV positive, but has been orphaned by the loss of both parents, with the frail and destitute granny the sole remaining caregiver in the home. I don't think there will be any institution that will be able to accommodate the speculated number of orphans. So I think this problem is not the government's problem. It's not your problem. It's not my problem but it's our problem, all of us. I think we need to come together, all of us, churches, uh, community clubs, or whoever out in the community there, uh, put our hands together and try to help our AIDS orphans in South Africa. We are faced with a serious disaster, you know. I think uh, six years to come, we'll have every neighbor having somebody infected. And we are faced with a lot of orphans, parents dying. So we, we are going to miss a generation. Monitoring TB clinics throughout Soweto, Hope Worldwide sets up support groups for patients diagnosed as HIV positive. The groups meet once a week. Individuals are counseled, their condition monitored, and they are taught skills and involved in income generating projects. When they fall ill, they are visited in their homes and family members are taught how best to care for them in the home environment. For those in need, food parcels of fruit and vegetables are made available. The main, main uh, thing is to give them support because once they are diagnosed that they are HIV positive, going home, and telling someone that, look, here I am, I'm HIV positive, it's a, a very difficult thing to do because they are not sure how the family members are going to respond. So the main objective of Hope Worldwide, of having these people come here, number one, is to give them support. Secondly, we educate them about the disease itself because uh, most of them, when they're diagnosed, they hear about it, but they don't know much about the disease itself, so we educate them. Thirdly, is to help them not to spread the virus. Those who are pregnant, you know, we help them with the issue of breastfeeding and, you know, so on. The difficulty is that we have an enormous number of HIV-infected people. So even if we improve the HIV situation, we're in for a major AIDS epidemic. So what we have to do now is we have to prepare for the dramatic escalation of AIDS and at the same time keep working on reducing new infections. So we have to get over a wave of AIDS before we would get the benefits of reduced infections that we may be starting to achieve and certainly are confident that over the next couple of years we will achieve. Throughout the world, Poverty, social inequality and lack of education are the societal factors upon which global afflictions such as HIV AIDS feeds. The most readily afflicted are those already marginalized, stigmatized and discriminated against within society, long before afflictions such as HIV AIDS appear to further complicate their lives. In Africa, these are the rural poor, and within these communities, Long disempowered by their circumstances, the most vulnerable of all are rural women, totally dependent for their survival and that of their children on their male provider, and powerless to influence the sexual behavior pattern of the breadwinner outside of their relationship. But when I first came to this hospital in 1995, I hardly saw any AIDS patients. Now, I was from Uganda, and by the time in Uganda, it was you know, sky high. And I said, ooh, I mean, this is better practice. At least now I can see medical patients, you know, and not having to look for HIV in every patient. And now in about five years, when I go to the wards, about a third of the patients would have AIDS-related illness, the medical wards. It is high. It is very high. There are quite a lot of people who are positive. Sometimes you cancel about 15 patients, 
and you find that maybe six or seven are positive? I can say out of 10 babies that are admitted, you will find that about four of them are having HIV. For those orphaned by the untimely loss of both parents, eking out an existence from handouts in a remote mountain village is a bleak prospect. With no breadwinner in the family, shunned by neighbours, superstitious that the family's bad luck may rub off on them, older children are forced to drop out of school to find some means of employment and help the surviving adult caregiver to look after younger siblings. What I think AIDS will do if it continues to rise, people will become more and more aware that they start saying no to some things, okay? I mean, uh, a woman will come up and say, in the past it was okay for my husband to have, you know, another woman on the side or two, but the way the situation is now, I won't accept it. I want to live at least for my children. Uh, it will get to that stage. Um, in Uganda, it got to a stage where if a man had to go and work miles away from home, his wife would elect to actually go with him rather than have him tempted and then, you know, the whole family or the children being offered. We are having quite a, a number of uh, campaigns done, but they're still not enough because as a hospital like this, if maybe one or two nurses are going out in schools, we are having more than 200 schools, we cannot cover them all. We're trying to get a, an AIDS clinic running and we're trying to see how we can help them with home-based care. Because that's what I see is the, the future. We can't get all the AIDS patients in the hospital, it won't run. We wouldn't be able to cope. With the need for home-based care now a given, what of medication and quality of life for those living with HIV AIDS? Freelance graphic artist Judy Seidelman has been living with AIDS for an estimated 13 years. <laughs> Nobody lives forever. That's one of the things you learn from AIDS. Diagnosed in 1990, for Judy, a mother of two daughters, now young adults, the discovery that she was HIV positive was brutal. When her partner of six years collapsed, was found to have TB and died three years later. Even so, Judy considers herself more fortunate than many others, in that her family are most supportive and are financially in a position to assist her afford the best doctor and the prohibitive cost of her current retroviral combination medication. Certainly with my current salary, I couldn't um, afford the pills. And having my parents pay for it certainly is a, is a wonderful blessing. As far as I'm concerned, I know the drugs are working. I mean, I, my um, immune system is supposed to be normal at the moment. And, um, you know, when I get flu, it's flu. It's not, am I dying this week? And so on. And these drugs are available, but they're expensive. Part of living with HIV is just normally living a healthy life. And most people with HIV probably can survive that way for quite a long time and not even worried about the drugs. They don't put you on the drugs till your immune system has already started to collapse. Which means, you know, getting exercise, good nutrition, taking vitamins, probably not drinking or smoking cigarettes too much. All of the, the standard things that they tell you are good health ploys. And I do agree that this is an issue of poverty a lot, and we have to be able to face that. And things like having proper housing and having good water supply and all those other things that should be part of the RDB and should be what we're doing in any case. And I think we really have to start addressing those and addressing them in terms of that's one of the, probably one of the best things we can do for people with HIV in this country. Everything I've seen and the way I analyze it is that if you use condoms regularly and always, it's actually probably just as safe, if not more safe, than having different affairs with people without using safer sex, even if you think that both you and they are uh, not infected. Because partly you don't know. I mean, I keep telling myself I was infected for at least three years. 
before I knew anything about it. And the same with my partner. Probably for him it was longer. But I don't know. I mean, I can't tell that he gave it to me either. I've always thought it seems likely in terms of the sequence of things. But it's certainly not fair to blame him in some way. When it could possibly have been me at some other period in my life. I mean, I think I was positive for three years before I found out. For all I know, it could have been seven, in which case it could have been a different story altogether. Nine out of ten of the people who are positive don't know it. The sudden death by heart attack of renowned Soweto musician Mike Machalamela on the 5th of May this year was not AIDS-related. But before he died, Mike, together with his wife Victoria, shared the pain and prejudice suffered by their youngest daughter Mercy, one of the first women in South Africa to publicly declare her HIV status and campaign selflessly for the rights of people living with HIV and AIDS. I'm very close to my father and he was very hurt for many reasons as, a, as any parent would be, you know, if you want your child to be successful and suddenly there's this disease that you know it kills. But gradually I helped them to help themselves and to be able to help me. My family was labeled in different ways. My father being a musician was people who were like, hmm, you know, Mtanaga Bramaike. And it went as far as the church, where my mom could not, at some stage, go to church. Whenever they say mercy is sick, I become more worried that any time they can say mercy, she's going to die. But mercy, when she comes home, she, she, she looks very pretty. And then I ask myself, but where, where is that disease? No, Mercy is going to bury me first. I can say me independently that I'm free from the stigma attached from HIV because I don't allow it as an individual. And so is my son who has learned today to say, if you say my mom has got AIDS, what about your mom? Because she probably has never, never had a test. I'm happy she's my mother. I'm fine with it. She's HIV positive. I live with her. I sleep with her. See, there's, there's nothing wrong. Sometimes she kisses me. I don't have worry. It was in 1993, when pregnant with her second child, Victoria and Corsi Corner, that Mercy was diagnosed as HIV positive. As a consequence, she was brutally assaulted and cast out of her home by her husband and at the time dismissed from her place of employment. Victoria and Corsicona were subsequently born and diagnosed as HIV positive, passed away at age two in 1995. I thought my baby had died already in my tummy, <laughs> but then I was told she's still okay, she's all right, and then I gave birth. Actually, I gave birth the same day that my mom was born. Her English name was Victoria, which is my mom's name. But her Zulu name was Ngosikona. Ngosikona means God is there. And because I knew secretly alone during those days, I knew that no one knew except the nurses and the doctors at the hospital, but most of all, the only one person knows my secret is God. She was quite healthy. She had the right weight for a newborn baby. In the process, yes, we faced a lot of problems in terms of her getting sick. Every time going to go to hospitals where the stigma is still there as well, where you could not get your child to be treated for silly bronchitis, you know, coughs, because it's a waste to treat such a child. There's no bed for such a child. And one's babies had to be sacrificed every time until one was able to say, look, I pay tax. And if I pay tax, and if the constitution of the country say every child has got equal rights to health care, so is this child. And obviously I'm not asking you to cure her. I'm saying put the oxygen on her bloody mouth and just allow her to breathe. A month before his death, Mike Machalamela shared one last triumphant moment with his family 
when mercy, in acknowledgement of her actions in speaking out and addressing public forums, thereby giving thousands of women and men hope, and for her outstanding commitment to educating South Africans about HIV and AIDS, was awarded an honorary master's degree by the University of the Witwatersrand. The citation acknowledged Mercy as a woman who in adversity had fought against illness, prejudice and disadvantage with dignity, courage and success. For all this work really, one has never been formally employed and for all this work one has never been secured in terms of a medical aid scheme, insurances, even education for one's child's school. Uh, but one has been honoured. <laughs> but I'm afraid I want to say that this paper, it's not changing anything in my life. I, I'm, I, I'm still not employed by private sector, you know, uh, in the context that I want to work. I don't want to work only as a person living with HIV, with HIV and AIDS issues. I want to work just like anyone with my own interest. The pain and prejudice associated with HIV and AIDS know no boundaries of class or position in society. Diagnosed HIV positive in the mid-1980s, without his consent by a well-meaning family doctor doing a routine annual checkup, Judge Edwin Cameron was notified on a Friday afternoon by telephone, undoubtedly the most shocking experience of his life. Recognizing the relative security associated with the privilege of his position, Judge Cameron went public in 1999 in solidarity with those less privileged. If you are told that you have a fatal illness, with almost all fatal illnesses, if it's leukemia or cancer or some disease like that, everyone's natural reaction is concern, support and sympathy. But AIDS and HIV are different. There's a stigma. I fell very, very ill in 1997, at the end of 1997. And it's a frightful thing to be ill with AIDS. There are people tonight watching us who I think are feeling like I felt then. You feel the fungal infections throughout your mouth, around your mouth, on your skin, down your esophagus, right into your stomach, that stops your stomach digesting your food, stops you feeling healthy and energetic and strong. You feel a terrible weakness. So it's scary. The antiretroviral medications work for most people. And for the people for whom they work, they reduce the virus to undetectable levels. There's no machine in the world today that can detect the virus in my body. That means that your body, because the virus is being kept in check, the drugs put a throttle hold around the neck of the virus and the virus stops replicating, it retreats to the furthest corners of your body. Then your body can start getting strong again. I'm today before you, fully strong, energetic, healthy, vigorous, and joyful in my life because the drugs are keeping the virus in check. These drugs save lives and these drugs are not expensive to produce. They can be produced cheaply. They are being produced cheaply. They are being kept expensive by the drug companies which want to make huge profits from them. To me, that seems a shameful and immoral situation. It seems to me untenable that I should be alive and well and healthy speaking to you when other people watching this program tonight are feeling unwell, are facing death, are facing debility, are facing the terrible symptoms that I've faced. Youth are the most affected by HIV infection and they are also the most willing to change. It is easier to change young people's behaviour than men of 40. So it's very important to reach youth through the school system. Our school system interacts with 1.2 million youngsters almost every day. It is built into the curriculum. Um, teachers aren't always well prepared for the role and some principals and school governing bodies are uncomfortable with it. The source of that is denial around youth levels of sexual activity. A lot of young people are sexually active. Actually it's from 13 years old. I think about 10, 7, 14. I'll say the age of 15, 14, 15. Well, according to me, I think from the ages of 12, 13. I think mostly 14. I think at the age of 12 years. When they come from primary school, most of them are, in fact, sexually active, which means 13, 14, when they should be playing with dolls, and they're not. I'm not going to have sex before marriage. 
uh, and a human being and I do mess up and go against my own beliefs often but to the best of my ability I try to follow the biblical views on courtship. If I'd found a condom in my son's pocket that would be the beginning of a long discussion. <laughs> a few of my friends I know are sexually active but they don't really worry about it you know they don't think it's their problem it's in the rural community or something like that. And I also see as a parent that it's very important for me to actually go to them with questions, not to just expect that they would communicate. Guys in general always see women as, well, at my age, see women as like a, just a sex thing, you know, you can kiss her and do this, that, and the next thing on one night and then the next night be with somebody else, you know, they're just there for your enjoyment. I mean, I know that amongst the black girls, a lot of them are sexually active, and I, and I wasn't quite sure how sexually active the white girls are. But what I found out is that about 60% of the girls, in my standard alone, are sexually active. I'm very aware of AIDS, I think. We have a guidance class, but I mean, there we discuss other things. No one's really comfortable talking about their sexual behavior, and so we talk, normally talk about careers or just petty problems, petty problems. Now the whole reaction to AIDS is usually, oh, another AIDS talk, because we've had so many of them, but not structured one-on-one. -on -one. If I'm watching TV and something comes up on AIDS, I change the channel immediately because it's all I see now. And I suppose it should be all I'm seeing because it's killing so many people, but I've just become very bored of it, and I know a lot of people feel the same way as well. I'm not sure if my girls are sexually active, and if they are they would also not tell me and I want to believe that they are not. She does tell me to be careful and she does tell me to worry about what could happen to me. I mean I know personally I live, I'm a, I'm a middle class person, I, we can afford most of the things that are around. I've got a really great future ahead of me, I do well in school. So I shouldn't mess my life up like that. Myself, you know, I used to be negative about the disease until it happened in the family. My cousin has just died of, of AIDS. We are burying her on Saturday. And there is a war which is killing the youth almost every day. The most social gatherings which we attend today are the funerals. But we are not told that the people whose funerals we are attending have died of HIV and AIDS. Just abstain. Don't rush for things that are not for your age. Well, I'll say to most of the girls and boys, just abstain. It's the best thing to do. But if you are sexually active, you can use a condom. We've never discussed uh, sexual problems or a topic that concerns sex. No, we don't discuss sex with my parents now. They will kill me. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, I mean, in our culture, we don't usually talk to our parents about sex, you know. But uh, since these shows have been introduced to the TV, I mean, I guess they understand that I've reached a certain age whereby, I mean, I, I have to know about it, these things. Days of our lives, when they like start doing the things that she likes, um, go and go to the toilet, do something, or go like go and play outside. She doesn't talk. She's not open. But my auntie sometimes talks, but she doesn't get to the point. I'm willing and able to assist when they've got questions, but they haven't yet come with questions. And so I, it's hard for a parent to just say, okay, let's sit down, let's talk about AIDS. Every guidance period, we're talking about relationships, conflicts within relationships, everything about relationships, sex and everything, pregnancy. You know, we're getting enough knowledge. It's only once a week, unfortunately, but uh, actually we just talk about it with our teacher and she would tell us that, I mean, guys, if you feel you're sexually active, you have to use something to protect yourself from these diseases. I didn't have that uh, much information until I got pregnant. I was 15. Uh, he was 23 years old. 
he, he just told me that uh, he, he doesn't want a baby. I was so scared. I even thought of uh, having an abortion, but didn't have anyone to tell about, to tell, but I just said, it. I will see what will happen. I, I think I was thinking she was a baby. She, uh, I never think that she can have a baby in that age. She cried, but she, she didn't say anything to me. She just uh, accepted that I'm pregnant. But now I can see she's no more a baby. I'm talking to her, like using condoms, uh, I'm talking about that, like uh, asking whether did you take your pills or did you go to the clinic for injection. I do talk about that. They should use condoms and to prevent themselves because they can see that there is pregnancy with HIV on the other side. It's not only pregnancy with HIV and we should, they should focus on condom use and abstinence because ab ab abstaining is not just, they won't just abstain. It's not an easy thing to do. I'm scared. Me, I'm using condoms, yeah, because I'm a single parent. I'm using condoms and I'm telling my child to use the condom. In today's life, one has to do certain things to mix in and that applies tremendous pressure on today's young people. Maybe my friend has a boyfriend and she's having sex with her boyfriend. And like, maybe I want to be part of that clique. So now I also have a boyfriend and have sex with him to please them. More girls, and even in the lower standards, is falling pregnant. So I don't think it will ever stop. I think it's getting worse because it's like, they see somebody's pregnant and was pregnant and maybe now that you can come back to school so they think it's nothing wrong and they also do it. Low self-esteem has got a, a plays a major role in, in, in all of that because a lot of our young girls don't know who they are. They, they're not secure within themselves. And the first person who shows a little bit of affection and attention, it it's boosts their ego, even if it's just temporary. And, and they feel a sense of security and a sense of love. And a lot of our kids actually come from broken homes. You're a young person, and there's, there's this older guy, and he has money. So he wants to buy you, buy you love. And all you should probably do is have sex with him. I mean, you get, for example, a young girl in standard, in what, grade eight, roughly 14, 15, and then it's a 26-year-old male. I mean, there's, there's something wrong with that equation. And they like just using the girl. Um, and as long as they um, get pleasure out of having sex with that girl, they're not quite interested whether she falls pregnant or whether she gets any diseases. It's, that more people's going to get AIDS. Yeah, it's going to rise. The AIDS level is going to rise, especially in the youth, because the youth, they they like ignorant. They don't believe that there's a, such a thing as AIDS then they still run around having unprotected sex. The statistics show that we, we were looking at a younger target group. I mean, initially it was 18 to 25. Now it's 12 to 18, which is the high risk group. So we, we, we need to look at attitude more than teaching them skills on how to use a condom. Most parents, when people from life skills attend our school and hand out condoms, then they say, no, they're encouraging the young people to have sex, but it's not like that. The young people are already having sex. You know, many people today don't necessarily die from AIDS-related sicknesses. They die mostly from rejection. And we thought that a song like My Friend with HIV and AIDS is still my friend would be an applicable message. My friend with HIV is still my friend. My sister with AIDS is still my sister. My brother with HIV is still my brother. My mother with AIDS is still my mother. We actually co-wrote the song together with the kids. Um, 
because it had to be a message not from an authority or an apparent, you know. It had to be a message, you know, from children who are concerned. Please, whatever you do, do not discriminate against people with AIDS, you know. Bungunawe Gigi, the young people, boys and girls, you know, love everybody, you know, because that actually is the spirit of Ubuntu, and that's what it's all about. Oh, that's so All you people out there, that start helping. Sick people were never left in our townships. They were never left to die alone. Today, people are dying alone, people who are dying of AIDS. We can reach out to help people to speak, to help people to accommodate, to help people to find treatment, to help people to, to get access to drugs, to help people to fight discrimination and unfairness and, and stigma. There is something that each of us can do. No one asked for this disease because if there was someone who did, that person really doesn't know the pain we are in. If it's children and people, need all the love and the support. We're happy and maybe the day big like energy's for me to you. Won't you say you love me too?